So we're here to talk about your first months as a full-time author. This will be a good session if you are a full-time author and only recently made that transition. This will also be a good session for you if you're planning to be in the next year or two. Who am I? <laughs> My name is Kevin McLaughlin. You can read all about me up there. Uh, I've written, a, well, a 102nd book is coming out at the end of this month, so I've been doing this for a little while. Uh, this is the class that I wish I'd had back in 2016 or 2017 before I went full-time. Uh, this is the information, I based, when I put this together, I put this together to be fun, but I also put it together to give all of the tips that I really wish that somebody had told me way back when. So I hope that this will give all of you the information that you need to, to catapult you up to that next level. This is one of my favorite quotes. I've had this on an images on Facebook for years now. People who say it cannot be done should not interrupt those who are doing it. You're going to find some people who are going to tell you, you can't be a full-time author. You know, like, that's a waste of time. It's not true. This is one of those fields where it, your success is directly defined by how hard you work at it and how hard you work at, most importantly, doing the right things because it's not enough to just work really hard at a hamster wheel if you're not doing the right things. So hopefully we can learn what some of those things are today. Who here wants to write books for a living? Okay, now that's not the only mountain. So I just want to add that too. You know, Craig talks about his mountaintops and there's more than one and that's okay. And everybody's different paths and different mountains are theirs. But everybody here sounds like wants to write for a living, so that's where we're going. Know your why. Understanding one's why is pivotal for aspiring full-time authors. If we don't know why we want to do this, at some point along the line, that, I'm going to have a seat. <laughs> at some point along the line, all of that work is going to feel like too much. All of that work is going to feel like it's a, a, a pain in the neck like it's a hassle, like it's a, a drag on your life. If you know why you want to do this, then all of that will be a sacrifice you're making to achieve a goal that has deep meaning to you. So think about that for a little bit. You know, like why do you want to be a full-time author? Is it because you watched some movies and saw the millionaire author uh, you know, like getting wined and dined by their publisher and, and the glamorous lifestyle? And all, because I have bad news. <laughs> That's Hollywood. <laughs> but if it's because you love telling stories, if you love sitting down at the keyboard and writing that next page, boy, this career will never let you down because you're always going to be loving going into work the next day. Know your why. All right, when we're getting ready to make the leap, that's the, the run-up toward full-time. Uh, this should be a planned process. Don't do what I did. All right, I'm, I'll tell you a quick story. Back in 2017, I joined SIFWA for the first time ever. That's the Science Fiction Writers of America. I think it's the Science, Fictures, Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers Association now. They changed the name. Uh, but the, I, I joined them, and then I got invited to speak at their conference shortly afterwards, but I had work. So I, I chatted with my wife and uh, promptly gave my two weeks notice at work so that I could speak at the conference. I had actually been planning on going full time, but not for a few months afterwards. And uh, jumping the gun made things a little bit harder for me. So if you can, plan this process out as much as possible. The more planning you can do in your run up to going full time, the more successful, you're, the, more, you, the higher your odds of success are going to become. There's three main elements we're going to look at today. Financial planning, habit planning, and social planning. Financial planning. Yes, I'm a science fiction writer. That's why I have rockets and, and, and planets and stuff all over, my, all over my presentation. Also, it looks cool. Right size your life. Back before I was in writing, I was in game design and game art. And uh, some folks, some very smart folks at a company called Garage Games wrote an article about right-sizing your life for game developers. They were like, move somewhere cheap. Don't buy the new car. Don't, more, you know, don't get a second mortgage. You know, live within means that are reasonable for whatever it is you're trying to do. The more debt we load onto ourselves, the bigger the house we buy, the, big, the more stuff we accumulate, the harder it is 
to make this stuff work. If you're working as a lawyer earning $200,000 a year and you're spending every cent of it, jumping to a full-time author making $75,000 a year might be really hard, even though $75,000 a year is perfectly reasonable income if you've right-sized your life. So be aware that by planning toward a, a future where your money is going to come in in bursts, it's going to come in in uh, fits and starts. You might have a few months of downtime where you're not earning as much, and you have to all you have to be able to prepare for that. Reserve fund, <laughs> have one. I didn't. <laughs> it worked out anyway, which was good. But having a reserve fund is good. Now, how much of a, of a reserve fund do you want? That's really up to your individual case, and it brings us back around partly to the right size of your life thing. If you are spending two hundred thousand dollars a month, um, or sorry. $200,000 a year, <laughs> um, uh, then you, you probably need a bigger reserve than if you're spending $50,000 a year right now, okay? Just because if you break an arm and can't write and your book sales tumble for six months, what happens? I just had that happen, folks. Uh, last April, I ended up with an injury that the doctors couldn't diagnose. And I ended up in... Uh, in basically daily pain from April through October. Uh, they finally figured it out. I had a surgery, I got it fixed, but I had six months where I was barely able to write at all. My sales are way down now. Um, so if that had happened early on in my career, it might have crashed me. I might have had to go back to a full-time job. I might have had to go back to regular work and start over from scratch. Uh, having some sort of a backup that will carry you through at least the worst of any major life roles that come your way is really helpful, and I strongly recommend it. How much? That depends on you. How risk averse are you? The more worried you are about risk, the more you want in the bank before you make the jump. Um, the more you're spending per month right now, the more you want in the bank before you make the jump. Taxes. <laughs> Full-time writers are almost always making enough income to warrant a corporate tax structure in the United States. I can't really talk about tax structures in the countries because I don't know anything about them. But in the U.S., you probably want to jump to an S-Corp or LLC filing as S-Corp, certainly by the time you're making $50,000 a year pre-tax. Obviously, check with your accountant first, but that's by $50,000, you're safe in every state that I'm aware of in most regular financial situations. You're probably saving money. Now, the way that this works really briefly is, uh, and most some of you probably already know this, but we pay something in the United States called CICA tax, uh, self-employment tax. We basically pay the employer's side and the employee's side of the Social Security Medicaid, so it's 15.2%. As an S-Corp or LLC filing federally as an S-Corp, we can take half of our income roughly, again, Talk to your accountant, because <laughs> your specifics may vary, as dividends, which aren't tax SICA. This means that if you're making $100,000 a year and you shift to S-Corp, you can potentially save yourself about $7,500 a year in taxes. This is a big deal. This is a lot of money. Now, you're going to probably spend about $1,000 of that on your tax accountant, but that's okay, because <laughs> you're still saving money. Again, check with a tax professional in your state for the details of that, but be aware that by the time you're jumping to full-time, there's a good solid chance you also want to be jumping to an S-Corp or LLC filing as S-Corp. Medical insurance. All right. For those of you not from the United States, how many non-U.S. people we have here? All right. There's quite a few, or just a few. You're lucky. <laughs> we don't like you. <laughs> um, in the United States, medical insurance is a real challenge for self-employed people. Now, it became much less of a challenge in 2012 when the ACA opened up exchanges across the country, so now we can buy insurance, and they are required to give it to us. Yay! Um, but it can also be really expensive. Fortunately, there are some options. Some states have really cheap exchanges. Uh, Massachusetts costs about half uh, what Texas does. <laughs> um, I don't know why. But for a family of five, basically, you're looking at paying twice as much for your insurance in Texas as you are in Massachusetts. So your state matters. And again, this is part of going back to the right sizing your life stuff. Um, sometimes moving is the best bet. Sometimes moving can really help. There is also another thing. There's, uh, there are a group of different 
authors organizations, the Authors Guild, NINC, CIFA, RWA, Mystery Writers Association, a couple others that I'm forgetting, got together and they formed a coalition which arranged with Lighthouse Group to get insurance for authors. So if you're in one of those states that uses an exchange that has the higher price stuff, you can frequently cut your insurance bill in half by going with Lighthouse Group. So uh, join NINC. I, it's, NINC's my personal favorite. Join NINC or one of those other groups. NINC, N-I-N-C, uh, uh, Novelis Inc. But... Um, <laughs> But uh, they're my personal favorite. I like them. But uh, join one of those groups, whichever one's appropriate for your career. That gets you access to the Lighthouse Group. And if you're paying a ton for insurance, there's a decent chance that you might actually be able to drop your bill. All right. Habit planning. This is all mindset. And this is one of the things that really kills people when they go full time. Old habits break. So before I was writing, before I was writing full time, I was writing at work. I was a nurse. I was working like 50, 60 hours a week as a nurse, and the only time I had to reliably write was my lunch hour, which I was sacrosanct. I would throw in headphones, I would eat, wolf down some food, and then I would write for the rest of that hour. And um, when I went full time, I thought I was going to increase my productivity massively. Because, of course, I now have all of this extra time. But what actually happened was my habits broke. I didn't have this set-aside time every day that I, had to, that I knew I was writing. The old habits were gone. And so I needed to build new ones. Productivity drop. It is typical for productivity to drop during the first three to six months of full time. Expect this. Plan for this. Your habits have broken, and you need to build new ones, and it takes time to do. So if your productivity doesn't increase or worse, even drops right after full time, that you're, you're just like everybody else. Congratulations. <laughs> um, not everybody faces that, but it's really, really common. I would say it's more common than not to end up with this sort of problem. Now, the way you can get around this is to start building the new structure and the new habits first. So the, you know, like I talk here about you know like new structure, but ideally have a basis for the new structure down in writing and ready to implement before going full time. Plan it. Say I understand that these old habits that have been serving me well are about to fall apart because I no longer have the structure of going to work every day. Okay, I'm now going to be building a new structure, and I if you can anything you can do to plan that out before you make the jump will save you time and save you effort and increase your productivity after you make the jump. Uh, new habits. And this is a, I have a personal gripe. Everyone talks about like the 21 days to a new habit. And if it really worked like that, boy, we'd be in great shape, wouldn't we? And the reality is uh, the, some people have studied it and the range is 18 to 254 days to build a new habit. Um, the average is 66 days. Um, this is, by the way, why smoking cessation stuff only goes for 21 days, because they know it's not going to work, so they get you back in again another time when you try the second time. How do I know this? <laughs> um, give yourself the time to build new habits. It's going to take you at least two months, in most cases, to lock in new habits, and it might take you two-thirds of a year, and that's okay. You're not a bad person for not building habits in 21 days. Again, that's normal. Social planning. <laughs> this is now your job. So you need to block time for it. Convincing your friends and family that this is now your job can sometimes be difficult, however, because you're staying at home, right? You're not actually in work anymore, so they, don't, you, you, they can stop by and say hi, right? They can hang out. They can call you. They can, uh, no, wait, you're at work. You have to set boundaries. And this can be very difficult, but you have to find ways to let other people in your life know that this is still your work time. Uh, for my children, I actually had a, uh, when they were young, I actually had a, a red headset. When, when, when daddy had the red headset on, he was in a sprint. <laughs> and it, the sprint were, was only 30 minutes, so they needed to come back and find me in, in a half an hour or so. Uh, unless the house was burning down, they went and got mom instead. <laughs> But um, I still made myself available because when I was done with the sprint, they would come in and see me. But you have to find ways to work with the other people in your life 
to make sure that they understand that this is still work, work time. Losing connections can be a big deal. Writing can be a really lonely experience, especially if you're used to being in a workplace surrounded by all, all these people that you've worked with for years, your friends, your coworkers, your, your people. Well, they're gone now because you're not seeing them anymore. You're home. Building new connections is the way to move forward, but it can be a real challenge. Um, work from home is not always the best bet. It can be for some people, but don't be afraid to go out to the coffee shop. I know John Scalzi makes fun of us for writing in the coffee shop. Um, he doesn't really, but he wrote a good book about, about it. Um, but it's okay to go do that. I've done that a lot. And then you're around other people, and you get to know the people who are working there, and you get to say hi. Um, maybe you join a writing group online. Maybe you join a sprint group. It, online isn't as good as in person, but it's still something. Maybe you come to conferences to see your friends. That's one of the main reasons I come here, guys. I love meeting new people, and I love seeing all my old friends. And this is one of the main times of the year that I get to do that. Uh, this is my, my social week, you know, and, and I really rely on those. But build a new find new ways to build new connections with people and work on maintaining some of the old ones too but don't be afraid to reach out and start building new connections you're you're transitioning to a new work life don't do it alone we still need people uh, yes please yes please I, I will I will leave time at the end for questions don't worry all right building your team all right, I've got two slides for this one because I believe that nobody should be locked into just into your trad. So I'm talking about a little bit of both. Uh, we're going to go through this pretty quickly because I think that most people know this stuff, but editors, cover artists, virtual assistants, and other services. There's a lot of different things you can bring in as an indie author to your team. Don't overdo it right off the bat. Give yourself time to find the tasks that you need most. Obviously, you know, most of us are going to need an editor. Most of us are going to need cover artists. Most of us don't need a virtual assistant right off the bat. Figure out what things in your, in your business you need to outsource, the things you don't like, the things that are eating up a bunch of your time. And then once you're succeeding at a level where you can afford to hire a VA, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Other services, I think everyone probably has talked about BookFunnel in every session the entire week. So I'll say it again. Book funnel. <laughs> um, it's an amazing service and very, very valuable. Sales tracking tools, audiobook narrators, and there's, there's tons more. Uh, I, I think that most of the sessions here have talked about some sort of service or, or additional person that you can bring in. Do it organically. Do it slowly. Build from you outward at a pace that you feel comfortable with. Don't let other people rush you into saying, oh, well, you need to get a higher VA right now. You need to have a, a, an editor lined up for your next six books right now. Pace yourself. It's okay to bring this stuff in one step at a time. You don't have to rush things. What about traditional publishing? Well, traditional publishing has changed a lot in the last five years. I, I Honestly, when people think about traditional publishing, they're usually thinking about like the big five, right? Or big four, I think it's going too soon. But um, I don't actually look at them all that much anymore. Uh, the best publishers right now are folks like Athon and LMBPN, and uh, in my genres anyway, science fiction and fantasy. The the best publishers are, are Mountain Vale, Shadow Alley. They're the little guys because these little companies they're hungry. They pay about three times as much as the traditional publishers do per sale, and um, it, it, they they kind of rock in, ter in their terms too. They're great people to work with because they used to be indie authors themselves, most of them. Um, so I would seriously look at traditional publishing as an additional iron that you can put in your fire. About half of those 102 books I've published are traditionally published through LMBPN. The other half are indie. I mix and match, and I am totally comfortable with doing that. Traditional publishing opens up some additional options for you, too. You, can, you might want an agent if you want to go to a big publisher. But you, more importantly, you might want a foreign rights agent because that is something you can sell your French rights to a French publisher and your German rights to a German publisher and I don't know how to do any of that but I do know that there are people who specialize in that and that's a very valuable team member to add once you're selling your books pretty well uh, some authors opt to hire an editor even for traditional books personally I don't 
but um, as a newer author, it can be valuable just to have an editor do a pass of the thing, or maybe have a somebody do a, a, a manuscript assessment, you know, early on in the process to see if you're on track or not. And an accountant. And this is actually good for both indie and trad. Uh, the bigger you get, the more complex your taxes are going to be. And by the time you switch to S Corp, <laughs> you really probably, most most of the people in this room will probably want to hire somebody for that. There is no turbo tax for, uh, for S Corps, and um, the, the tax forms are a pain in the neck. <laughs> so it's, it's just generally better to hire somebody at that point. All right, wall of text. <laughs> strategic career planning. I, I had so much I wanted to say here, but looking at this as a long-term thing is really important. Looking at strategies rather than tactics is incredibly valuable. Create a five to ten year career plan. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to stick to it entirely, but having it down means you know where you're going. You've got a map. And if you change your direction or you change your destination, then you change your map. But that's, and that's okay. But you still need to have the map to know where you're going. And I'm not saying you have to have a five-year plan in order to succeed as an author, because I clearly didn't, and I actually managed it anyway. But I am saying that having been there, it would, it would, it would have been enormously helpful for me to have that in place. Strategies over tactics. Tactics are short-term things that don't work, that, that, that might work now that work today. Strategies are long-term thinking that affect your overall plans for the future. Work on building strategies over tactics. Tactics are good for the you know for the moment. Strategies are good for your five-year plan. Diversification. Think about diversifying not just in terms of genres or formats, but also in platforms and revenue streams. Multiple avenues for income reduces dependency on a single source, even for KU. How many people here are in KU? KDP Select. Okay, so how many people are, are, are not? How many people are in, in with some and not in others? Ah. <laughs> um, even for KU authors, there are other opportunities. You can Kickstarter your, your hardcover edition. All right, you can, I know people who have six-figure subscriptions for their stuff that gets released into KU right after it's done. They just uh, write the chapters, put them up on their on their Ream account, and um, their big super fans pay them a monthly fee of five or ten or fifteen dollars a month to read the chapters before they get published for real. And then when they go into KU, they come down off of the off of the subscription. Lots of people do that. It's huge in lit RPG. It's massively growing in romance as well. Um, other genres are, are, are starting to pick it up as well. I honestly think that subscriptions are going to be one of the fastest growing areas of publishing in the, in the years to come. But diversifying, you can do it even if you're in KU. You don't have to l limit yourself. Building a loyal readership. Your reader is your most valuable asset. Strategy doesn't on how to grow and nurture your reader base. Consider things like consistent engagement, exclusive content, or even loyalty programs. Okay. Um, It's easy to sell a book to somebody. It's harder to sell a second one, unless the first one really gave them a delightful experience. So one of the things I, I say to focus on is the idea of delighting our readers. If everything we do aims at delighting our readers, then you know like we're doing the right stuff. A, a friend of mine, Christopher Hopper, started his uh, new website and subscription stuff and stuff like that. So I'm like, I'm going to check this out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what this is. So I entered my name, and he asked for my mailing address to join his email newsletter. I was like, well, that's interesting. I wonder what happens when I do this. So I entered in my, my mailing address, and a few days later, I got a nice little card folded over, like Christmas card type card, with a poker chip inside of it, a personal note from him, and um, some other odds and ends and, and, and cool stuff. All right, this was a free pile of stuff that he gave me for, in the mail for signing up for his newsletter. Guess what? I'm still subscribed. <laughs> That sort of thing, that's dynamite. That builds an outstanding customer experience. And the more we can do that sort of thing, the more we build lifetime fans. And that's, of course, what we're aiming for. We don't want to sell them one book. We want to sell them all of the books we write forever. <laughs> Delight them. 
make them love the experience all of it not just reading the book but anything we can add to that experience which makes them happier and makes them feel better is a win the only the only constant in publishing is change if you were a traditionally published author in 2007 the world just ended because Kindle released and KDP came out and now book publishing was going to be flooded with a tsunami of trash and it was going to be the end of publishing as everyone knew it and no one would be able to find good books and no one would be able to make a living as an author anymore and of course none of that actually happened guess what we're doing it again now AI is here and it's the same thing again people are literally saying the exact same things that they said in 2007 because I was there in 2007 I remember it is this scary? It can be. Is this a change? It will be. Will there be another change five or ten years from now? Absolutely. The only constant in this business is that it will change over and over and over. And we need to be adaptable. We need to be able to change with it. So yeah, I study all of the new things when, it come up, when they come out. Whether or not I implement them, that's another story entirely. But I need to know about them because that's my job. That's my business. Adapt, improvise, and overcome. <laughs> the future of writing. You probably have heard a lot about this stuff here today uh, over the last couple of days. But uh, I honestly deeply feel like we are in the middle of a massive transition away from the retailers toward various forms of direct sales. Website sales, crowdfunding approaches. How many people were inspired by Brandon Sanderson's amazing success on Kickstarter okay that just rocked uh, if he can do it we can do it too okay maybe not that much <laughs> but we can still have success there too and not only that but every single person who succeeds like that brings the bar up for everybody else brings brings everybody else up along with them Sanderson brought millions of people of readers who didn't used to be on Kickstarter into Kickstarter guess what they're still there so now that's a bigger option than it ever was before and now and people saw a huge increase in uh, in their Kickstarters in the wake of that subscriptions I already talked about this a little bit but I really do feel like this is one of the fastest growing areas in the market right now just like audiobooks were not too long ago and still are a, a fast growing area subscriptions are gonna be huge uh, they're only for your super fans it's gonna be slow growth but if you're getting in now right now for subscriptions is 2011 for indie publishing right now and all of you here who thought boy I wish I could have been publishing back in 2011 let me tell you it wasn't actually all that much fun <laughs> it wasn't actually all that much easier than it is now but we did have a little bit of an advantage because there wasn't as much competition it was new the people who started a few years earlier had that extra edge but you're right now in that early cusp you're in that early phase and this is a good time to adopt if you can if you have the the, the bandwidth for it resilience I think that there's been a lot of sessions here this week about mindset and I think that that's incredibly important for an author um, especially if you're looking at going full-time as an author resilience is our ability to stay stay the course back in 2011 I was part of an anthology of 13 up-and-coming science fiction and fantasy authors five years later there were three of us left all three of us are still publishing today but five years 10 out of 13 fell off the map and have never returned and if you look around this room probably half of the people in sitting here won't be here five years from now still publishing so resilience is about staying the course resilience is about building systems to take care of yourself as well as your business make sure to make time to do that because I would really love to see everyone here still here five years from now all right and I am almost exactly at the time that I wanted to be <laughs> so now is a great time for questions if you have any please come up and ask uh, and ask them at the microphone 
We have a question from Cole, who is watching on Facebook. I'm right here. <laughs> Cole would like to know, I don't know how to start to find a virtual assistant. They all say they do everything, but what specifically can we have them do? How do you find one? How do you set expectations? What does your assistant do for you? At present, I don't have one, partly because I was I, I was ill and everything kind of slowed down. I've actually, I had a fledgling subscription. I canceled that. I, I, I've shut down a lot of stuff this year, and I'm just starting it back up again. In terms of finding a good VA, I would ask you, ask on groups. Ask some of your friends for their references and stuff. This is the same way I find editors, too, by the way. <laughs> I, I, I go and be like, hey, uh, who's editing for you right now? Oh, yeah? Are they good? Cool. I'll send them an email. <laughs> and, and you can do the same thing with VAs. Go and ask around. Authors are usually happy to share their VAs because they, we're usually not working them very often. We're working them for like a few hours a month and then they're working for a bunch of other authors too for a few hours a month. They're piecing something together. Um, so that, in terms of what you can, they can do, updating back matter, uploading books, managing your email list, managing your promotion catalog, uh, a calendar. Boy, that one's super helpful for me because I'm always forgetting who I did a, who I, who I scheduled a, uh, a, a, an email swap with a month ago or something like that. Um, that can be really helpful. Any task that you can easily hand off to somebody else and don't like doing and that isn't directly related to your creative work, that can be outsourced. All of it. All right. Question? Uh, just a helpful comment for you. Belay, B-E-L-A-Y. They're U.S.-based VAs and they're fantastic. You can hire them for two hours a week. There's no required minimum or anything like that, just for everybody wants to know. There you go. Uh, and they're proven they're, they're a good company. So they did not pay me to say that, Kevin. So <laughs> uh, my big question to you is, is so um, I've been fortunate my kids are out. I'm one of those empty nesters now. I'll be 59 next March. My writing, I have to have it quiet. I can't go to the coffee shop and think and do what I do as a nonfiction writer. So I read there's a certain author that built his – perfect writing area and took an old building and just restored it as to its original was no internet no phones all of that is that tell us how you set your space up for most productive and creative writing thank you mm. boy um my most productive writing uh, writing time is is probably the kevin anderson method i go and i take a long walk with a recorder um, and, and I found that actually that dictating that way um, gets me exercise and gets me outside in fresh air where I'm seeing new things, and it's actually kind of fun too. Um, but when I'm working in a coffee shop, I throw on noise canceling headphones for sure. <laughs> um, when I'm working at home, it's I'm I'm alone at home, so I have a I, I, I have more distractions, and I don't often get as quite as much done. <laughs> but uh, I I have a, a, a nice desk set up, and I'll work from there usually when I'm at home. But again, I'm I'm alone. I just throw in some music and and get to work. No problem. Question. Hi there. So my question is, like many people here, I'm learning all kinds of things at the conference, and I'm the type of person I'm the type of person who wants to do all the things like at one time, which is not humanly possible. Um, how do you recommend we go home and prioritize these things? That depends on the individual author, but I completely understand the, the, the FOMO issues because I have them too. How many books do you have out? Five. Write more books. That's your, that's your top priority. Until you have, like I would say, like 12 plus books out, there is nothing more high, that's a higher priority than, than writing the next book. Um, even now, today, nothing moves my books better than the next release. Um, and, and, and so that would be my primary focus. The next thing I would do is I would look at what you were, where you want to be in your five-year plan. Mm -hmm. Sit down and make it first off. Mm -hmm. Where you want to be in your five-year plan, and then start piecing away mm -hmm. at what when you want to be doing the different pieces of it. So, I want to. <laughs> I just uh, an hour ago told Mark Leslie Lefebvre that I want to be a top ten Kobo author, uh, f fantasy Kobo author, <laughs> and he's like, "Oh wow, that's really cool," but. I, now I'm going to have to make a plan because I went and said it. <laughs> um, but now I have to go and make a plan for how I'm going to achieve that, and then I have to enact the plan. And that's really what it comes down to. And it's okay if the plans change. Um, and if something new comes up, it's okay to explore it. Uh, Wix just went and integrated with uh, Book Vault, and I went and spent a day uh, looking at Wix to see if I wanted to do that for direct sales instead. No, Shopify is still better. But uh, for me, anyway. 
but uh, you know, like, don't let don't let FOMO drive you off track. Don't let the fear of oh my gosh, this shiny new thing over here drive you off track for too long, at least. Anyway, try and stick to your plan. Or if you find your plan veering from where you wanted to go now, adjust the plan. Make sense? Yes. Uh, I'm a U.S. author, so thank you for bringing up health insurance. Um, you mentioned NINC, uh, SFWA. Um, do you know if Ally also has access to Lighthouse Group? I, I honestly, I'm not sure. I, I, I don't think so. They're UK based, um, so I, I don't know if they're part of the consortium, but I, I, I don't think so. I'm not sure. Okay, I'll look into it. <laughs> thank yeah, you. Yeah, sorry. Um, Hi. Oh, oh. There we go. Okay, sorry. Um. So you mentioned subscriptions, which that's part of my five-year plan, right? I think that'll be a really viable way to, um, you know, add an additional source of income. But I have ADHD. Uh, how do you put in, like, your the things you need to put in your subscription platform, like, into your schedule? Like, how do you bake it in, I guess? Let me know if I need to elaborate. Um, elaborate a little bit, yeah. Okay, so um, I've tried subscriptions once or twice, mm -hmm. and you know, we, I have a I have a smaller audience, so a few people are interested, and I know I need to grow it. Um, but one of the things I struggle with is being consistent. Okay, so are you writing every week? Yes. Okay, that's what should go in your subscription. Okay. You don't have to actually make extra work for yourself to do a subscription. You can just do early access. Mm -hmm. So you can give them your chapters as you write them. Run them through Grammarly or something just to pick out the worst of the, the copy edit, the worst of the typos and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, tell your readers that this is the raw, unedited work, and some of them will love that. And a lot of them will actually go buy the edited, finished book <laughs> afterwards too. Okay. okay. These are your super fans. Mm -hmm. They want the story now, but they will frequently also want the hardcover edition later. So um, do you don't have to add extra work to do a subscription. You can still do something like that while maintaining your focus on the number one thing that we should all be doing, which is writing more words. Does that help? Yes, it does. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hypothetically, uh, somebody did not come to this presentation before quitting their job <laughs> <laughs> and didn't do all of the getting ready steps, what advice would you have for them? Well, that was me in 2017. Um, and I, my advice to pass me was don't do that. Um, <laughs> but if, you've already, if you're already there, uh, hypothetically, write. Because, it, you know, like your product, it, work on your writing and work on your marketing. Um, those are going to be your two areas that move the needle the most. More releases and better marketing for the books you already have out there. How many books do you have out? Five. Oh, okay. Yeah. So your primary focus is probably going to be your writing. Are they in a series? Uh, yeah, I've got one complete trilogy and I'm working All right. on seven parts. Uh, I have a I have a book called Zero to Sixty Author that I usually I just offer for people for free on on Book Funnel. Come see me afterwards, and I can arrange to get you a copy. Uh, but basically, it's talking about one way of going zero to full time fairly rapidly, and there might be some tips in there that would help you out a little bit. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's right now. It's in Kevin Anderson's big uh, book bundle for for uh, NaNoWriMo too. If, if that that has some amazing books in it. <laughs> Uh, to follow up on the subscription question and just sending out early access chapters, if you're a little bit more of a pantser and sometimes characters just pop up in the middle of the book or you're just referencing a, somebody with a placeholder name saying, ah, the guy with gray hair right now for, for now. So can you still do that as a subscription? Uh, yeah. Just tell your readers. Tell your readers that it, 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 it's, it's rough draft. Um, and your readers will understand when they sign up that that's what they're signing up for. Um, the other thing I would mention, though, however, is that it is it is a it is a commonly a commonly shared fallacy that pantsers have to produce very poor first drafts. Um, I spent about two million words learning how to write uh, very good first drafts, and I, write, I, d I do discover writing myself. But at this point, my first drafts are about ninety nine percent identical to my finished drafts. And um, that is 
an objective that people can obt can attain if they want to. All it takes is a, a deep, intuitive understanding of plot and structure. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want to go that way, you can get darn near flawless chapters out of your first draft. It does take practice. It does take work. But you can do that. Even as a discovery writer, you do not have to be a plotter to do that. OK? No, but maybe I should. <laughs> we have two online questions. Amy would like to know, what type of recorder do you use when you're out on your walks? Um, all of them. I have a little Sony handheld that I use sometimes. Um, I have uh, a, a Smart Mic Plus um, that I'm really fond of. If you're using a Bluetooth microphone, for your phone or whatever, uh, make sure it transports in 16 or 24 bit. Make sure it's, it, it transfers that. Uh, basically, it has a Bluetooth 5 or better. Um, but yeah, I, I've tried so many different microphones and so many different tools. Um, really, most of them work. You just get a good microphone with a good cardioid setting. Uh, cardioid or super cardioid microphones will w basically only pick up your voice. They don't pick up a lot of the background information. They don't pick up the car that just drove past you or the wind or what have you. Um, and understand that if you're outside, it's not going to be perfect. So you, you're still getting the wind, and so you're going to have some problems with you know with, with the the translation, the dictation not being exactly perfect. So you're going to have to do some cleanup, but that's okay. It's the price I pay for getting outside and having a nice sunshine walk. And Leanne would like to know, how does one come up with a five and ten year plan? Any resources you would recommend? Okay, apparently I need to write a book on that too. Um, really what I usually would tell somebody is, where do you want to be in five years? Okay, do you, you want to be making a million dollars a year five years from now from your writing? Okay, so action plan, what do I need to do in order to be doing that? Um, you know, like how many backlist books do I need? Uh, and, and these can be estimates, but once you have the numbers down, then you can begin feeding the numbers that you're receiving back into it. Does that make sense? So I if I don't have any metrics, then I don't know if I'm succeeding or failing. So if I say I have a five-year plan and at the end of the five years, I'm going to be doing this. And at year one, I'm therefore going to have to have done this much of that. Year two, I've done this much of that. Year three, I've done this much of that. Year four, I've done this much of that. Um, then you know every step of the way if you're on track or not. And if you're, you hit year, the end of year two and you're still at the year one goals, it's time to reassess and reset because you're obviously not going to make that five-year goal in the same way that you were planning on. Something went, something went weird, which happens. It's not, it's not a fault thing. All you're doing is you're getting, creating baseline numbers for what you want to do and then you're comparing them to the real world numbers that you're getting as you progress. Um, a lot of people have been talking about doing a newsletter to build your audience, mm -hmm. but how do you build your, do your newsletter for an audience that is non-existent to create your audience, if you understand what I mean? So the non-existent for what? So they're saying, uh, first thing you should do is create a newsletter, mm -hmm. but who would I be sending that out to if I've got a really tiny audience, and how do you start building that audience if you haven't book got funnel. that many book funnel? Okay. Uh, back, of, back of your book ads, for one thing. I, I do reader magnets for every major series, and um, th that's like a short story about my characters or some kind of little, little vignette story about the, about the characters from that series. And every book in that series then carries an ad for that. They click the link, they go to Book Funnel, they give me their email, they get the book, and it's exclusive. So they can't get it, they can't buy it from Amazon. My reader magnets are all exclusive to my subscribers. If you don't subscribe, you don't get them. Um, that helps. And then you can use those same reader magnets in joint promotions on Book Funnel or uh, uh, Story Story Origin is the other one. Uh, those will those will work great. I can pick up when I'm pushing hard. I can pick up 200 new subscribers a month very very easily with Book Funnel giveaways because um, I just get into some good joint giveaways. I have good covers on my on my reader magnet. Um, they the, the reader magnets should be every bit as professional as your published as your regular published works. Okay, last question. I think that's all we have time for. Uh, you talked about subscriptions and specifically like chapters early. Uh, I think you mentioned Ream, but like, what would you? Is that the one you'd recommend? Or Ream uh, is because there's a whole bunch out there. <laughs> Ream is really dynamite because it's built for writers. Okay. Patreon 
is also a decent one, especially for lit RPG, because there's so many readers in that genre already familiar with it. Beehive is another good option. So there are some other options out there, but Ream is specifically built for authors, so I would seriously look into that. Uh, Ream, R-E-A-M. Yeah. Um, Ream, Patreon, uh, Beehive, which almost nobody's using, but I think it's actually going to be really, really good. Uh, people use some other stuff, too. All right. Thank you all very much.